Hello everyone and welcome to question hour 14. We're here to answer your questions on the economy, markets and investments with Mr. Sunil Subramaniam, MD at Sundaram Mutual. Um, Sunil, we've got a ton of questions, so if you're ready, can we begin? Of course, Shweta, thank you and uh, good day to all of you and short, Shweta. Right, so the first question, Sunil, is, is now the right time to invest in international markets? I think that's a good question and the answer is yes. And why do I say that? It's not because I'm negative on India, but that's because investing in international is an investment plus decision because the world overall has been affected by COVID and the world overall is going to bounce back. Now, while India is going to bounce back faster and probably longer than others, the fact is that other markets also got beaten down so badly during the pandemic that there are good investment opportunities arising from various other geographies. That's number one. Number two is the emerging story of recovery in the advanced economies will be the story of a stronger dollar. A stronger dollar means ipso facto a weaker rupee. So sitting in India and investing in international means you get the benefit of the currency depreciation, which is expected to occur. I may remind you all that over the last decade, about 4 to 5% per annum has been the weakening of the rupee. Most recently, it has strengthened, so actually represents a good buying opportunity because in the long run, a strong dollar plus the need to support our exports with a slightly weaker rupee will mean that international investing will deliver a double benefit from the growth markets outside of India and from the currency weakening. So it's a good, good, very good decision to diversify. The next question, sir. What is the growth potential of the Indian economy in the next three years, both with retail and wholesale consumption? So I think that uh, we should be heading for a period of uh, high single digit GDP growth, right? So this year we'll see a double digit, uh, you know, 21, 22 will be about nine and a half to 10 percent. But the next year onwards, the base effect will not be there of a bad last year. So I think. Uh, on the back of a 95 to 10% GDP growth this year, to post another 7% will be very good. And I think that the Indian economy is capable of sustaining. Now, in terms of the drivers, uh, this is going to be after a very long time that we are going to see both manufacturing and the services and consumption both support the growth of the Indian economy. So I think that individually these sectors will represent double digit growths and agriculture as you know the monsoon has been weakening a bit and we've had two very good monsoons so to expect again sustained excellent monsoons is probably not correct so we will have a single digit agri gdp growth so bringing the overall down to a high single digit gdp growth but both manufacturing and uh, services and consumption should post strong double digit growth in the next three to four years the next one sir how do we understand uh, today's market scenario? You know, as investors, we uh, would like to understand it. So, you know, what do we keep in mind before we invest and for what we've already invested? Is now a good time to book profit? So, uh, two things here, right? In terms of the understanding the markets, I think one has to understand that liquidity is probably the single biggest factor which has driven the markets up post the pandemic. And this liquidity is driven by quantitative easing, that is note printing, buying of government bills by the central bankers of the world. And so there is world is awash with liquidity, hence risky assets like equities have risen to all time highs, right? Now, the question is that what should one as an investor look at it? I would say that when the liquidity reverses, and it's only a matter of time before the liquidity reverses, because the liquidity is because of the bad news of the pandemic. As we overcome the pandemic and good news comes back, the focus of central bankers will shift from supporting growth to fighting inflation, which means interest rates hikes, reduction in liquidity, which will have its impact on the stock markets, right? So while the recent liquidity wave has taken up all kinds of stocks, regardless of quality, in the longer run, the withdrawal of liquidity will affect the poor quality stocks more than the good quality stocks. At the same time, this withdrawal of liquidity will be supported by a growth of the Indian economy. So Indian economy will attract its own share of resources from foreigners. So from that perspective, I would say there's an investor, right? You should keep your focus on quality 
and on domestic strength. Stocks and sectors which are very closely linked to domestic growth, right? And good quality names, low debt to equity, right? Good corporate governance, good ownership by their promoters, you know, good practices. The good quality companies would outshine the poor quality ones because the poor quality will suffer the liquidity drag the most. So stick to a core principle of looking for good growth prospects, which is what supported by good quality and stay invested with a domestic focus as far as Indian stocks are concerned. In terms of is it time to book profits? Well, profit booking in the equity markets should always be linked to goal achievement of your investment. So I would say that even if you have not set goals for each of your investments in the past, take a look at your portfolio and set a goal for it, right? Once you achieve the goal, regardless of what the market situation is, you should liquidate your portfolio. So always profit booking has to be linked with the aim of what did you invest for? What was in your mind? I think that's the key because the markets will go up and come down. Even from this levels of Sensex, 100,000 Sensex in some years from now will happen. So you would have made good returns. But the point is, do you need the money now? Then you will liquidate. Thank you. The next question, sir. Should we continue our SIPs now? And if we would like to start a new one, which is the best mutual fund for an SIP? So, yes, you should definitely continue SIPs. Like I said, only the maturity of the SIP is the time to book profits. Never pre-close an SIP. Because if the market is correcting, it's actually fantastic value for SIP because the whole concept of rupee cost average helps you to buy low. And then when the markets are high, when you redeem, when your SIP matures, you would have gained the biggest from buying those units at these prices, right? At those particular correction points. Now, the point is that if you're going to start an SIP today, where should you invest, right? I just draw attention to the previous answer, domestic oriented. Now, when I say domestic oriented, then automatically it means that mid and small caps will have a fair share of the profit pool in the stock market. So I would suggest a multi-cap or a flexi-cap fund as the ideal SIP vehicle because in the flexi cap, the fund manager allocates across large, mid, and small. In the multi cap, it's the same, but there's a minimum 25% in each of the large, mid, and small stipulated by SEBI. So what happens, even the fund manager gets his call wrong, you are not going to get affected by it because you have a stake in every part of the cap curve. So I would recommend a multi cap, flexi cap approach to starting SIPs today, and please do not start them for less than five years. The next question, sir. What is your view on interest rate for forecast? Uh, I think uh, interest rates uh, are set to rise uh, in the medium term. The reason I say that is that there is a pressure from inflation which will force the central bankers, international as well as RBI, to at some point shift their focus to fighting inflation, which comes from hiking interest rates. So when they hike interest rates, economies' interest rates will rise. The second aspect is that when growth rebounds, Right. Again, the fear from an RBI perspective is that inflation will run away. So if inflation runs away, then the country's health gets affected, fiscal health, and our rating will become under. So RBI has a responsibility to maintain our country's fiscal health also. So I think it's a matter of time before the economic revival means there will be demand for funds lending. And when demand exceeds supply in any segment, whether it's money or it's gold, you will see prices rise. So in interest rates case, the price is the interest rate. So I think that you know, over the medium term, interest rates are definitely started to rise from the levels that they are currently. The next question, sir. What is the percentage allocation for a retail investor between equity, debt, and gold for a horizon of three years, aggressive profile? Three years, aggressive profile, I would suggest um, 60, 30, 10. 60 in equities, 30 in debt, 10 in gold. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next one, sir. Uh, should I continue an SIP in Sundaram Mid-Cap Fund? Could you also elaborate on the performance a little bit? Sure. Uh, yes, you should definitely continue it. The Mid-Cap Fund went through a recent bad patch, uh, starting from about 2017 onwards. Uh, the reason for that, the Mid-Cap Fund traditionally has been managed as a smaller, mid and small cap. Right? Within the mid-cap universe, it takes smaller mid-caps and significant small caps. 
it takes sectors which are linked to domestic economy. That's the positioning of the fund over a very long period of time. It has delivered very good returns over a long period for that reason. However, since December 17, the Indian economy has been a slowdown, further enhanced and accentuated by the pandemic that happened. Now, hence the portfolio suffered. So what the fund managers have been doing is to reallocate the portfolio to a higher mid and small cap and to take on a little bit of large caps to give it more stability. However, in the same period, after the pandemic, as the mid caps and small caps started rising, these were not essentially domestic sectors, but more like IT and pharma, which were linked to the pandemic and linked to uh, external uh, export-oriented kind of sectors. So the fund did not capture that rise. But as I laid out just now, the story emerging over the next three to five years is one of domestic economy strength. And the mid-cap portfolio is ideally positioned to capture that. It has been through a bad patch, but if you had already got an SIP in mid-cap, in that bad patch, you have got your in units at a better price. So when the fund recovers, which is only a matter of time, I would say you know, the three to five years should be among the top funds in the industry, that time you will find that these very units in these times are the ones which are giving you the greatest gains. So I would strongly say that stick with the fund, you know, keep your faith in that fund. It's one of the best long-term uh, wealth creators in the country. If you take the track record, which is available in public domain, we'll see it has given 20% plus returns over its lifetime. So I would encourage you to not lose faith in the fund and definitely it will bounce back with double strength. Next question, sir. Uh, where what is the outlook of the Sensex and Nifty as you know they are reaching new highs? And what target can we see them at at November and six months from now? So I think that uh, these uh, short-term uh, Sensex and Nifty predictions are likely to go very very wrong because. As you know, the recent rise over the last few days is because the Fed has come up with dovish comments in terms of when they will taper. So it's all fact-driven, right? If the hard news on the U.S. economy says that recovery is going to happen fast, tapering will happen fast, then markets will correct fast. If the slowdown uh, is continuing in the U.S. economy, the growth is not coming back at the speed expected, then the dovish stance will continue, then the markets will continue to benefit from the liquidity. So it's a hazardous to guess, uh, guess in terms of November or in terms of six months from now because the news on the economy, this is the ground level information of people buying consumption, infrastructure and all of that. Those are all data driven and only the emerging data will give us a direction. So I would hesitate to put a price target on a Sensex or a Nifty from a shorter term perspective. You ask me the same thing, so say maybe five years from now, four years from now, I can tell you that they can very easily double from their current levels in that time frame, but not for a six months or a November, two, three months time frame. I think uh, it's as good as a lottery at this point. Next question, sir. Will the market rise again? And if so, how much time would it take? So I think that the markets are currently at a fairly uh, high levels in terms of the valuations. There's a lot of expectation of a bounce back, V-shaped bounce back, which has been factored into the earnings, right? Now, market can rise further from this if the liquidity continues to pour into the Indian markets from FIIs. At the same time, right, will the markets rise from this or will there be a fall before a rise? One has to remember that tapering is a matter of time. The whether it will happen in a month from now, three months from now, six months from now, or one year from now is the question. So from a perspective, there will be a time that the markets will consolidate and after which they will post a rise because then it will be moving to the fundamentals of the Indian economy. So the markets will definitely rise. But will they continuously rise? I would say not. Will there be volatility and fluctuation in the middle? Yes. And hence... If you stay through this volatile period and stick to your long-term goals, you will definitely see the market can touch newer highs in a matter of years. The next question, sir. What is the next NFO from Sundara Mutual? Well, uh, right now we are currently awaiting regulatory approvals on our principal acquisition. So we will be then merging the funds uh, soon after we get approval and we'll have a whole bunch of new funds to sell from principal stable. So I would say that only after we have fully absorbed the merger, integrated the teams, would we then look at new opportunities. So at this point, I think we'll be getting a reasonable amount of new funds from the principal stable, which uh, Salesforce will be marketing 
So I think they represent almost as good as NFO opportunities for the investing public. Uh, we've got one on principal schemes as well, sir, when we should purchase it through your AMC. But, you know, going by your current answer, this is when the merger is complete, correct? Yes. Next one, sir. Why is your global fund not delivering as much as others? Well, it depends because, see, it's a diversified fund. It's a quality fund because it's a brand fund, right? Now, brands give you stability, but brands are definitely not necessarily cyclical stocks which or commodity stocks which have seen a rally. So a lot of global funds which have commodities, we don't get commodities because they are not big brands. Uh, we don't get cyclicals because they're not big brands, right? The third thing is that we have restricted our portfolio to the top 30 brands in the world. Now, it happens that sometimes the 40th brand or the 35th brand shows a sharp rise, but we will not pick in our portfolio until it reaches the level of 30. One example in mind is Tesla, right? We did not pick Tesla because it's not yet made an entry into the top 30 brands. So it's an extreme focus on quality. Quality will deliver in the long run a stable risk adjusted return, but not necessarily that every wave or every country or every commodity cycle it can capture. Its intention is not that. That's why it's called a global brand fund, right? Brands which are truly global will only form a part of the portfolio. So that's why if you stick with the fund for a long time, you will find when other markets are correcting, these brands will have resilience. So it gives you a good risk-adjusted return. Another on global funds, sir. Why doesn't Sundra Mutual launch an active overseas fund uh, instead of a passive fund of fund? No, ours is not a passive fund of fund. It's an active overseas fund into which we are feeding. The fund is managed by our Singapore Sundra AMC, and it's an actively managed fund. Next question, sir. Status of CIO hiring? Status of CIO hiring, I think the interview process is in the final stages and uh, we expect to make an announcement uh, reasonably shortly on that. The next question, sir. What's your view on large cap or blue chip stocks right now instead of mid and small cap stocks? So large caps and blue chip stocks. So I would separate large cap from blue chips, right? Large cap contain non-blue chips also because blue chips are essentially defined by a particular parameter. Large caps are just defined by any market fancy stock will reach the top 50, top 100, it becomes a large cap. So the focus on large caps, which are non-blue chips, I would say that you've got to be cautious because the reason for their rise in the prices is the liquidity from FPIs, which has flooded the country. Uh, from overseas, right? But as far as blue chips are concerned, right, I think they have a stable base of economic performance on the back of which they are getting money. So I would say that the outlook for blue chips continues to remain strong because their economic performance is not a function of liquidity, but a function of their commanding strength over their respective segments. So even if there is a pullout of uh, money due to tapering, it is the blue chips which will take that beating and remain resilient. So I would say within large caps, if you stick to blue chips as a portfolio and keep the focus on that, then it's a very good time to stay invested in those. The next question, sir. Uh, the upcoming trends on FMCG sector, what do you feel about them now? So I think the second wave hurt the FMCG sector because it's a retail consumption sector. Uh, the ongoing uh, vaccination seems to have picked up a lot. Government has approved a lot of vaccines, and I think there's good progress, which means that, uh, and as you've seen, uh, the festival season should be a good boost for consumption. What is the counter to that? That the festival season can lead to a massive spike in COVID cases uh, due to congregation of people at shops and at malls and all of that. That could lead to a negative effect in terms of fresh lockdowns coming in. Just bear in mind what happened in Kerala during the recent Onam festival. In a single day, there were 23,000 cases, right? So I would say that the pent up demand post the second wave plus the festival season should give a good boost to FMCG consumption. But at the same time, bear in mind that a third wave resurgence, right? could lead to lockdowns and dampen the consumer system. So keep a watch out on the statistics which are published daily by all news channels and then take a call that FMCG consumption is going to be very, very, very uh, sensitive to this factor. Whereas if you take the durables in consumption, there is a sector called discretionary consumption or consumer durables. They are in a sweet spot because 
the interest rates are at very low levels, right? One. Second is people haven't spent their money for a long time, so they have the money and they have been postponing their purchases of a refrigerator or a TV for a very long time because of the lockdowns. So the festival season is a good sentimental time for them to get into that and go and purchase it. So, and this is an EMI-based purchase, right? So I would say that that segment of consumption should get a boost during the festival season. The next question, sir. Uh, will tech and pharma sector see, see the same growth in 2022? What is your recommendation as far as sectoral and thematic mutual funds are concerned? I would say that uh, tech and pharma both should do well because of what I feel is a depreciation effect, currency depreciation effect, as well as the fact that the world growth revival will lead to a demand for both their products. I would place tech slightly ahead of pharma because pharma is a more health and negative kind of a thing in terms of people falling ill, whereas tech is a growth story based on the move to cloud computing, the move to internet of things, the move to work from home, and a whole host of factors have come to help the tech sector. So I would place the tech sector as a number one in terms of the fact that it's an export-oriented uh, with rupee depreciation to help. So in terms of sectoral picks, right, I would put IT up there. And then I would shift the focus to domestic cyclicals because the new story is of the Indian government monetizing its assets, allowing the private sector and the foreigners to come in and help India's infrastructure develop, the PLI scheme to help India's export sector growth. So there should be a lot of factories being set up, a lot of manufacturing activities happening. So manufacturing, domestic oriented manufacturing, which will ultimately export. But in setting up these plants, capital goods sectors, cement, steel will all get. So I would say cyclicals, which is where broadly these follow, domestic cyclicals would be my next pick. So IT and domestic cyclicals. And as an overlay to both of them, I would suggest that you look at the BFSI spaces, banking and financial services, which include not only public sector banks, private sector banks, but also NBFCs, also insurance companies, also asset management companies, wealth managers, right? The whole host of them, I think they're all set in a sweet spot and they will have to support the growth of the Indian economy with lending. So their net interest margin should be healthy. So I believe that these three sectors should account for reasonably equal parts of your portfolio. The next question, sir. For a senior citizen, are mutual fund investments safe? Uh, the aim is to get a, a regular income you know, compared to fixed deposits in banks as well as reputed private companies? So I would say uh, very guarded and a cautious yes, because you should be careful about the schemes you choose and careful about how you derive that income that you set. So my thumb rule would be that stick to a hybrid category, right? You have aggressive hybrids, which are about 70% equity, 30% debt. You have balance advantage funds, which shift their debt equity as per market conditions. And you have equity savings funds, which have 70% in safer assets of arbitrage plus debt and 30% in equity. So based on your risk profile, you can choose. That being said, how do you generate income? You said regular income. The best way to generate regular income is to put a systematic withdrawal plan, right? And you don't need to do much, right? 1% per month of your investment will give you a 12% per annum return, right? So if you put that, some amount of it will come back to you from your capital, some amount will come from growth. But in very good years when the stock market is doing well, all of it will come from the growth in your portfolio. So the best way to assure yourself of a regular income is to put down a systematic withdrawal plan of 1% per month, which means it should last you for 100 months, even if there is zero capital appreciation. So 100 months is about 12, uh, eight, eight, 12 months in a year, it's about eight years. And with capital appreciation, I'm sure that you can double the period that your wealth will last you. So 20 years you can plan for in this roughly, with this systematic withdrawal kind of an approach. The next question, so uh, why do MF tax saver portfolios not do well, which is the right time to redeem? Why is tax being cut when dividend payment is very minimal? Well, uh, that's the way the tax laws work in terms of tax has to be deducted from uh, uh, income distribution, income withdrawal plan. Though the uh, capital appreciation is very less, it's still treated as dividend from the income tax perspective, and hence uh, the tax deduction occurs. So that's uh, something for the regulators and the and the income tax experts to end the CBDT to take a call on that. The second part is in terms of tax saver is that the composition of the portfolio, it's the same as what answer for mid cap, 
our taxable fund had a very high 50% made a small cap in December 2017. And then it got hurt with the fall in that segment. And then the portfolio is now rejig to percentage of some large caps, but it will take time to pick up as the, as the time goes by. I'm sure that it will bounce back, but I think it's still maintaining its uh, dividend track record. It's now the last two, three quarters, it's been continuously giving dividends. So I would say stay invested in the fund. It will definitely see better days. Um, the next the next question, sir. In big economic slowdown or recession in the near future in the Indian or the world economy? I don't think so. I think we've already seen the brunt of that. A world which was just about trying to recover from the previous recession and an Indian economy which was already slowing down before the pandemic. Pandemic hit both these segments pretty hard and brought the growth down to all-time low. I don't think that we are at a prospect of another recession so soon, right? Except if there's a Delta, Gamma pandemic, which again, when there's no cure for and no vaccine for black swan kind of uh, uh, events. But otherwise, the world is poised for a rebound and not for a degrowth. The next question, sir. I want to invest in a diversified balanced fund. Please advise. Yes, definitely. You can look at the Sundaram Aggressive Hybrid Fund, uh, which is about 70% uh, in large caps and uh, diversified across sectors. And I think it's a good performing fund. I think it's been rated well by Value Research, the four-star rating fund. So you can definitely look at that Sundaram Aggressive Hybrid, Equity Hybrid Fund. The next question, sir. Uh, why Sundaram Diversified Equity Fund performance is poor compared to peers? Mm -hmm. I think I just answered that question a couple of questions ago. Right, sir. Uh, the next one, sir. Does Sundaram have a Nifty-based MF? Yes, we do have a Nifty equal weighted mutual fund, which roughly invests uh, two percent in each of the Nifty Fifty stocks. So that's an equal weighted fund. So what it does is it it buys less of that which has already gone up, and it'll buy more of that which will go up. So it's kind of equally weighting all the Fifty stocks. It's, it's been there for some time. You can look at that. The next one, sir. Are REITs really as good as they sound? What is the expected ROI? How would you rate liquidity on a scale of 1 to 10? Liquidity, I would rate it around 3 to 4. It's not easy for uh, individual investors to liquidate. Uh, they are good investment options because they allow you a regular income from the real estate. And these are generally corporate leased uh, real estate. So the risk of default of the corporate from meeting the rent and all of that is not likely to be there. They also benefit from the capital appreciation of the real estate. So I think they are new uh, hybrid vehicles, which are fairly uh, good, but the real estate sector itself is a very cyclical sector. So bear in mind that whatever the cyclicality there affects REITs also. So while you get a regular coupon, which is the rent automatically coming, the real estate sector itself is uh, impacted by that. If you're willing to take the kind of risk that involves in the real estate sector, I would suggest that you look at equities as an investment class, which can deliver you better returns than the REITs. So REITs are something which mutual funds invest in in order to benefit, but they do that after a lot of research and study. So I would suggest that you play the REIT story through a mutual fund rather than directly. The next one, sir. Markets are at an all-time high and debt isn't offering good returns. So in such a case, where should we advise investors to invest? I would suggest that the equity savings fund as a category is a good place because it's got 30% in debt. It's got 30% in arbitrage, which when the markets are volatile, will give you a decent return. It's got 30% in equities. So it's a one-third, one-third, one-third. And you get the equity taxation. So which means that, you know, even if you redeem within six months, it's only 15% short-term capital gains tax. If you redeem after a year, it's only 10%. So the tax efficiency of the vehicle with the stability of arbitrage plus debt and the potential for equity to give a good return, I think is the ideal option for a debt investor to look at equity savings where the little bit of equity can help improve his returns. The next question, sir. Which fund do you recommend that can give maximum returns among Sundaram Blue Chip Global Flexi-cap MNC funds? Uh, we don't have an MNC fund. We don't have a flexi-cap fund. So between Sundaram Blue Chip and Global, right, I would say we can put an equal allocation because I think the times are good for Global. Rupee depreciation should add to value. And Blue Chips are the ones which are going to be resilient in the Indian stock market. 
the next question, sir. Um, please advise for investment about Nifty Fifty mutual fund. So basically, uh, it's it's uh, like headline investing, right? Nifty stocks are the ones which are the darlings of the FDIs. So they get a lot of liquidity support, so they will rise. So when you invest there, you're actually buying the market. So you need not have any confusion. Oh, market went up, my portfolio didn't go up, the confusion will not be there. At the same time, there are times uh, when a fund manager's stock picking helps beat the broader market. So I would suggest that if you do that, you get the market, but the potential for you to gain market plus returns, you're losing. So then if you put something in a large cap or a flexi cap fund, you will find that you will get an alpha over it over a long time. There are short periods of time when fund managers don't beat the benchmark, as happened in the post-pandemic. But that's because the rally was very concentrated. But over a longer period, in three, five, ten years time frame, fund managers ideally should be easily able to beat the Nifty as a benchmark. So I would suggest that you uh, allocate some amount to the Nifty 50 and some amount to an uh, active fund manager so that you get the best of both worlds. The next question, sir. What is the expected growth in the mid-cap segment in the next six months by the end of this financial year? Very hard to say because liquidity support is entirely foreign-driven, even in the mid-cap segment. Because if the foreigners start selling, the sentiment affects the mid-caps and the small caps, right? Now, retail investors will start panicking and pull out money. So a six-month time frame to ask for a... Uh, it's like a lottery, uh, effectively, I would say. It's hazardous to make a, any kind of an estimate as to what kind of returns a mid-cap uh, funds would deliver in six months' time. Uh, that wouldn't be the right approach to take. Next question, sir. With the COVID pandemic showing no signs of abating and the economy in shambles, how do you account for the unprecedented spurt in the stock market? I think you have used fairly strong words uh, in terms of that. I think the pandemic has been by and large controlled overall. You see as a percentage of the population that's got affected. Medically, yes, it's a very alarming crisis, but not economically. And you're saying that the economy is in shambles. I don't think the data are supporting what you say. Right, The Indian economy is showing a good bounce back from the pandemic. Data numbers which are coming out are fairly good. The business resumption index of Novara says that we are back to pre-pandemic levels. Unemployment levels are coming down and you're generally seeing a revival in demand. So I would say, I would argue against, and the future potential for the Indian economy is very strong. So that actually answers the question. So why the stock markets are rising? Because the stock markets are never about the present. There's a saying about the general world that buy on the rumor, sell on the fact, right? So it's for the stock market, I would say it's buy on the expectation, sell on the reality. So the expectation of Indian economic growth is what is drying up the stock market. And if you want to benefit from the stock market, then you should start looking at the economy in terms of what other market participants are expecting. And that will give you a good clue as to what's going to do well. And you can benefit from that. So even if your view of the economy is different from the market, the fact is that the market's view of the economy is going to dominate the market. So if you're looking at the capital markets as a wealth creating vehicle, then it makes sense to think about what others are expecting of the economy. You may agree or disagree, but make your investment decisions in line with those and keep the realistic decisions in terms of the economy that because when the market, if what you say is true and if what you expect comes through, at that stage, the markets may correct or may not correct. The reason being that while the markets will be disappointed that an ex economic expectation was false, it is at that stage, what is the future economic expectation which new market participants at that time will be investing in? So you could find that a series of disappointing economic news still doesn't lead to a correction in the market because the future expectation has not got dimmed. So I think it's always important to keep anchored to the future expectations of what the by and large the market participants expect and that is the trend which will then deliver to you value and wealth creation in the capital markets the next one sir are equity markets still bullish yes clearly equity markets are still bullish uh, they are uh, expecting the indian economy to bounce back they are expecting that tapering will get delayed and hence the liquidity support will continue so yes equity markets are in a bullish frame next question sir when should we buy gold and silver? Is it now or should we wait? I think uh, if you 
always have a philosophy of 5 to 10% in gold and silver you know put together i think that's good because the gold will do well when the world does badly in terms of war in terms of pandemic all right and the other way to look at is world does, gold does well when the dollar is weak so the dollar is a story of strengthening so i would say that money will shift from gold to dollar by the bigger institutions like the sovereign wealth funds and all of that so i would not argue that this is an excellent time to increase your allocation to coal but since there is always the risk of some negative news trade war or something happening keeping a 5 to 10% in gold and silver and such precious metals is the sensible strategy but not the time to take it to 25 40 30% of your portfolio next question sir is dollar strong going forward Yes, dollar will be strong going forward because we expect that the news on the U.S. economy front to get better and better. And when the U.S. infrastructure bill, if and when it gets passed in the second house, that means that there'll be a lot of demand from America and the future growth expectations of American uh, cyclical stocks will go up. So there'll be a lot of money flowing into the U.S. markets, which itself will make the dollar to rise. Next question, sir. Which debt funds to invest in from Sundaram? i would suggest that you look at our corporate bond fund it's a triple a rated corporate bond funds roughly about 2 and 1/2 years maturity of the portfolio it's a good quality portfolio and i think that's a good fund to look at the next question sir given the low interest rates and similar housing market to what we saw in 2004 can we expect a similar bull market for equities for the next 5 years or do you expect more money going towards physical assets going forward so i think there will be some amount of money going to physical assets because interest rates are very low and it's a good time to buy a house not just your own house to stay in but a house to rent i think this is the sweet spot but indians have always placed a high value on physical assets so overall trend is that as the country's per capita income goes up right your cost of the shelter all of that is going to be much less proportion discretionary income consumer surpluses will be higher and when that is done physical assets like air conditioners is are all bought on emi but incremental allocation to financial assets will is the one which will tend to go up so i would argue that uh, while real estate will show good quality growth i believe that the relative allocation of uh, individual human beings uh, to financial assets are the ones which are going to rise faster the next question sir there's so much money globally when will this slow down all assets including cryptos are going up yes this will slow down when very good news comes on the us economy so that the fed starts talking about tapering and talks about interest rate hikes when that happens all this liquidity will get sucked out and go back into us treasury bills and the dollar will start to strengthen and us interest rates will start to rise What is the asset allocation strategy you would recommend for an investor with a moderate risk profile for three years? So, with a moderate risk profile, I would reduce equity to fifty percent. I would increase the uh, uh, fixed income to thirty-five percent and put fifteen percent in coal. The next question, sir, is now the right time to buy real estate. Well, uh, it depends on what real estate. If it is income generating real estate, yes, I would say that if it's an apartment that you're looking to rent out, yes, you can look at it. It's a good time to do because interest rates, housing loan interest rates are all time low. Property prices have been fairly stable for some time now, and they are likely to rise. So it's a good time to lock in. So I would say, but if you're just going to buy land which is idle with no income generation, I would say not necessarily true because geolocation of your land. the demand what's coming up nearby all those are very very uh, expertise driven right so a real estate expert would take the right call but not a lay investor that was our last question sir thank you so much thank you uh, all the participants very engaging questions and very in depth thank you it was an enjoyable session look forward to our next month's question our next month then thank you and all the best stay safe during this pandemic